Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعسه ما فلا يذر إلا نفسه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وزكنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وزكنا اجتنابه آمين اللهم آمين يا رب Today obviously we are approaching Ramadan and so I thought it would be a good time to talk about some aspects of Ramadan. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran and my intent today is to go through a certain passage of Quran that deals with Ramadan. You know when it comes to the ibadat, the acts of worship, um, there is no part of Quran that describes an act more in a more comprehensive manner than when it comes to Ramadan. There's no like verses about the process of praying, when you should pray per se. You find that all in the Sunnah, right? You find the general commands, Aqimu Salah, establish the prayers, Warkau was judu, like these. illa just and they are all in different places of the Quran. You don't find in one place where Allah discusses salah from the beginning to the end to do this and this. No. Nor you find this for Ramadan, nor you find this for any of the other ibadat. Only for Ramadan you find its legal system and its wisdom both in the same part of the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. Which is what I'm going to try to go over today, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, O you people who believe, kutiba alaykum as fasting has been ordained for you, kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum, as it was ordained for the people before you, la'allakum tattakum, so you will have taqwa. Now the first point I want to make here is, <coughs> in Ramadan, instead of losing weight, sometimes we gain weight. Because we end up eating more than, we're, than, than we do in even regular days. What I want to mention here is something very important. When you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu the, the, the pious people of the past, they would eat on a normal day less anyway. Right? The amount of food that they would eat on a regular day is what we usually call in, in, in modern terminology intermittent, <coughs> intermittent fasting. If you're eating just once a day and you're not eating for like 10 hours to 16 hours a day, right? If you're already living that lifestyle where well, you're not eating much anyway, it's called intermittent uh, fasting. And there are many benefits of eating less. We all know this. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is that we should try to make sure that we're not doing israf with our own selves in the month of Ramadan after the iftar especially. Right? We're not eating more food than, uh, than, than we normally would. Because that would defeat the whole purpose of, 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 of I mean, legally it's fine. Legally after iftar finishes, you can eat all you want. But within the sunnah and within the spirit of what Islam wants, the whole point is to keep moderation and to eat, eat less than where you normally would. Uh, and then what you normally would be, would be to eat less anyway. Right? And uh, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Because our, you know, Muslims as a civilization, uh, there are, for example, many sayings of the, uh, of, of the companions of the Prophet 
that while there are benefits in eating meat, but the, the, for example, Ali radiallahu anh said, eating too much meat hardens the heart, right? And sometimes the Muslim community, they just love meat, right? We just love meat. Uh, and so maybe this Ramadan you might want to think about becoming semi-vegetarian, right? In a sense that uh, you're not eating as much meat. Uh, and, and, and as, uh, you know, the end times come, and, and I don't know if any of you know this, there was a big, the biggest study, the biggest study of cancer that was done it was called the China study. Maybe some of you are aware of this. The China study basically says that the biggest cause of cancer is meat. Because what are we feeding these animals? We're feeding these animals and giving uh, uh, things to these animals that are not their real food. It's not their natural food. Right? And so the result is that then, then we eat this meat and, and, and negative consequences happen. Having said that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum as fasting has been ordained for you. Now, kutiba means to write down. Something has been ordained. And this is one of the terminologies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran to, to let us know that something is far. How do you know something is far? Well, there is a certain way Quran talks, and when Quran talks in that way, it let us know that something is far <coughs> upon you. So, if the, so the, one of the ways is the word kitab, kutiba alaykum as Fasting has been ordained for you. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum al qital. Fighting in the cause of Allah has been written for you. It's ordained for you. You have to do it. Right? That doesn't mean that you do what Hollywood expects you to do. No, that's, I mean, it, there's rules, right? Like the fasting has rules, so jihad has rules too. In the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even for prayers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata kana ala al mu'minina kitabam mu'uta. Salah has Definite, is written for you according to timings. There's a certain time, and then prayers come in. So when Allah says something is written, you know when a king writes a command, that's it. It's a command. When a king writes something, it's decree. And that's what the idea here is. Kutiba alaykum as Fasting has been ordained for you. Kama kutiba ladina min qablikum. As it was ordained for the people before you. Now, so you find the Christians, they have fasting. And you find that the Jewish people, they also have fasting in their scripture. In fact, Jesus, peace be upon him, in the gospel, the gospel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew but there is still a lesson in this and that is that we should still talk less we should still learn because the fasting is just food is one aspect which is the fourth aspect but it still means that you should have better ikhlaq you should ha still have fasting in all aspects of your life with your tongue with your eyes with your ears Right? You should have fasting with all aspects of, your, of yourself. And Imam Ghazali talks about this in great detail. That, that when you look at the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, if fasting is an ibadah and you're in a state of ibadah, right, then you should be reading more Qur'an, you should be doing more dhikr, you should be getting less angry. That should automatically be there. Nowadays we just think that, oh, just do the surface. Right? Rather than the deeper aspect, we just do the surface. I'll just not eat for X amount of hours and then I'm done. That's, that defeats the purpose. This is why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kam min sa'imin. How many people will fast? 
they'll have nothing but sahr. They'll have nothing but hunger. They'll have nothing but hunger because they weren't in the spirit of Ramadan. They weren't in the spirit of fasting. And one of the things about this is that a lot of times our intentions defeat us. And what I mean by that is that a lot of us enter Ramadan with the intention, I'm going to be very good in Ramadan, but as soon as Ramadan is finished, I'm going to change. We enter Ramadan with this Ramadan with the idea that you're going to actually change, that you're going to let Ramadan change you and you will continue on that change after Ramadan. Otherwise, your whole intent, and you know this, this thing about intentions. Let me see how much time I have. <clears throat> I don't think I'll finish the passage today, but I'll mention a few important points about this. But intentions are extremely important. And we're actually beginning to learn about this in psychology more and more. You know, there was a time, because the Sharia doesn't require you to per se make an intention before every salah and before, but when you look at our pious predecessors, predecessors like Kitab un the book of intentions, right? Let me just share that with you a little bit. I, if I had time, one day I would like to go over some of these writings with you of our classical scholars. But like if you're going to a masjid, you can have many good intentions. Not just one good intention, but many good intentions. You go to the masjid with the intention that Allah, I make the niyyah that I'm going to go to the masjid to meet your, your, uh, you know, your, your servants. I go to the masjid with the intention of making you happy, right? I go with the intention of uh, fulfilling the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where the Prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Where are those people who meet each other for my sake and my sake only? Right? So whenever you're doing anything in your life, you can have more than one good intention. The Prophet said, and, pro and the most authentic out of all of the ahadith, out of all of the sayings of the Prophet, out of all of the sayings of the Prophet, the most authentic saying, meaning the one that has the most, you know, you could say, uh, authentic narrations and everything <coughs> behind it, is the hadith that's very famous. <inaudible> Actions are by intentions. And some of the pious predecessors, they talk about, you can have one, two, three, four good intentions for doing one act. And this actually helps purify your intentions. So even if you're like going into your car, you can have the intention of, oh Allah, I'm going into my car to do something halal, right? To get food for my, my family. So you can have good intentions, you can purify your intention for anything that you're doing, for any amal, for any action. You could do that. And so the same thing is for Ramadan. If your, ash, if your intention deep down subconsciously is, what? That I'm going to enter Ramadan and I'm going to change. And then after Ramadan, I'm going to change back. If you enter Ramadan with this intention, then you have kind of like defeated the whole purpose of entering Ramadan. And so subconsciously, even though we all have it, right? We all have it deep down that I'm going to become better in Ramadan and then I'm going to become not so good. So how do you overcome that? You overcome that by making an intention. By, by, by intentionally sitting down, either you can verbally say it or in your heart you say it, however you want to do it, but you have to say it to yourself that no, I'm going to let this Ramadan change me completely and fully. And I'm not going to change back after entering this Ramadan. So the one thing that you can do sitting here today is make the intention that when Ramadan comes, I'm going to change for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not going to change back, but I'm going to keep moving and pressing forward. Right? And Ramadan is that month that the Prophet used to pray. Allahumma ballighna Ramadan. I mean, there's another, uh, the more authentic version, uh, <coughs> which is Barak lana fi Rabaj, uh, Rajab wa Sha'ban. Oh Allah, give us barakah in Rajab and Sha'ban. Wa ballighna Ramadan. And make us reach Ramadan. It's, it's like, was the desire of the Prophet, if you've reached Rajab, then you're asking Allah, Allah, give me life at least till Ramadan. Anyway, the point is that we're entering into this month. It's a sacred month. And the Muslims need this month because the Muslim community is in a lot of difficulty from all over, the, from every direction. We're in so many difficulties that we've probably never been in such difficult state as we are in today in so many different ways. And so how are we going to get out of this? One of the ways we're going to get out of this is if we make the intention to actually connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whatever the fitans are around us, whatever the difficulties are around us, that our only way and our only escape 
is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our only, it's our only way out. It's our only way to, to find redemption and to find salvation in the situation that we're in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you people who believe, kutiba alaykum as sayyam fasting has been ordained for you, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, as it was ordained for the people before you, la'allakum, perhaps, la'alla means perhaps, you know when a king says, perhaps I'll give you this, perhaps, I, but what the king means is yes I will, but he, to, in order to show that it's still in my control to give it to you or not give it to you, he uses the word la'alla, perhaps, perhaps we will give you some taqwa, we will give you some God consciousness. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, fasting has been ordained for you as it was for the people before you. Why? So that the result of fasting, right? So from the from the from from suhoor till dusk, when you're fasting till maghrib time, the result is you have now been constantly practicing to be in the obedience of Allah. You're trying hard to be in the obedience of Allah. The result is when you the result is when you break your fast. By that time, you have gained some currency, and that currency is taqwa, the fear of Allah and control of yourself. The fear of Allah and control of yourself. This is taqwa. And, and the feeling, this is very important, the feeling, this is very important, the feeling that, taqwa is that feeling that if I do something wrong, taqwa is that feeling, that if I do something wrong, then Allah can do something in response. It's that feeling that Allah will do something in this life or the next life if I do something wrong. You say, taqillah, fear Allah. Not like you fear the cops necessarily, but you know that if Allah is watching, that Allah can take action for your action. Allah can take action for your wrong action. This is taqwa. It's the consciousness that I'm, and you're aware you're doing something wrong, and... Because you're aware you're doing something wrong, you now have a fear. Now that I did something wrong, I have to repent, I have to do tawbah, I have to change, I have to help myself to become better. Because if I don't, then there will be a reaction by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is watching me, there will be some accountability or some act reaction to what I'm doing. Inshallah, I'll continue in my second khutbah. الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون رب شح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي about Ramadan and intentions, there's also the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man sama Ramadan imanan wa ihtisaban. Whoever fasts in Ramadan with iman, with pure iman, and ihtisab. Meaning ihtisab here is looking at your intentions. Why am I fasting? Having isab. Am I doing everything in the proper way? And I'm making sure I'm not doing anything wrong. Imanan wa ihtisaban. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive his sins, whatever he was behind him and what was before him. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us have pure intentions for this Ramadan. And help us to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this Ramadan. Having said this, the next part is, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you people who believe, kutiba alaykum as siyam, fasting has been ordained for you, كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Like it was ordained for the people before you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you will gain taqwa. Now, you are practicing obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the result of that is, you get taqwa. Now, why do you need taqwa? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ This is the book, the Qur'an. Right? In Fatiha, and I usually say this to show the connection. In Fatiha you say what? اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide me to the straight path, right? The response to that is the Alik al-Kitab. This is the book now. You want guidance? You want light? You want enlightenment? You want understanding of, uh, of what's happening around you? 
the Prophet said وسلم, that type of understanding that doesn't look at the surface but looks at the, the, the real essence of things. When the Prophet وسلم, said وسلم, fear the firasa, the intelligence of the mu'min because he sees with the light of Allah. Which is? Uh, which is? One of the aspects of that is by looking at things through the light of Quran. And so anyway, الكتاب, this is the book, لا فيه, there's no doubt in this book, Udalil, guidance for who? People who have taqwa. So you fast in the daytime so that you can have taqwa. Then you use this taqwa so that you can now benefit from Quran. Because this Quran benefits who? The people who have taqwa. Otherwise you're, you're going to just listen to what Quran is saying and you're not going to be able to bring yourself to a position to apply Quran. So you are beginning in the daytime by fasting so you can control your nafs and at the night time you're listening to Qur'an so that you're able to benefit from the message of Qur'an and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ شَهُرْ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ This is the month of Ramadan. What is its real significance? The real significance of Ramadan is Qur'an. The real significance of Ramadan is the Qur'an. But reading Qur'an is not far. Fasting is fun. Why? This is an important question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have had us fast in any month. Right? But He chose the month of Ramadan to be the month in which we fast so that we can benefit the most from Qur'an. <coughs> and the real benefit of Ramadan is Qur'an. But in order to benefit from Qur'an, you have to have what? Taqwa. Now different people have different schedules. Somebody's very busy, somebody's not so busy, somebody can read a lot of Qur'an, somebody can't read a lot of Qur'an, and for this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make it fun. But when you look at the actions of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they gave the most emphasis, the most emphasis, on what? Spending time with Qur'an. This is why, can you imagine, that Umar radiallahu anh did something that even the Prophet didn't do. The Prophet three days in Ramadan is the Hajjud time, not Isha time. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas.